the veterinary college where I work, things go wrong and you just have to keep going. Uh, <laughs> you will get everything we were planning to give you, it'll be in a slightly different order. Um, but welcome everyone, thanks for coming along to today's seminar. Please, um, this is to make you much more familiar with the parasites that you're fighting um, with your sheep. If you have any questions as we go along, please shout out. We're going to be here all day. I've even brought some friends along with me um, to show you on the side here, some of the parasites we're going to talk about. We're spending the... Can everyone hear me, even on the back? Just put your hand up if it's a problem. We're going to spend the day talking about the most important internal parasites of small ruminants, both goats and sheep, um, here in Ontario. Um, and I should perhaps just introduce myself. I, my name's Andrew Peregrine. I teach clinical parasitology, which is exactly what we're doing today. The diagnosis and management and prevention of parasitic diseases. Um, my favorite area is small ruminants. I actually became a vet because for, I think, for four Easter holidays in a row, my family took me to a sheep farm uh, in the southwest part of England with 500 ewes lambing. And apparently the first morning I arrived, the farmer said, do you want to come and help lambing? And I disappeared at five o'clock in the morning and apparently didn't return for two weeks. Uh, and that happened for four or five years in a row, and after that I said I want to go to vet school. Um, so here I am today. What we're going to talk about today uh, are the most important intestinal parasites of sheep and goats. Uh, and what I want to ask as we go through this talk is, what are the gastrointestinal parasites? That's the parasites that live somewhere between the abomasum and the rear end of the intestinal tract of sheep and goats. But what are the parasites that infect small ruminants in Ontario? Fortunately, you, many of you have helped us answer many of these questions over the last few years. Because until about five years ago, we really knew nothing about this area in Canada. We always look south or to Europe. And the big question was, was it relevant? So I'm going to try and give you as much Canadian and Ontario data as possible. There are a number of different intestinal parasites that infect small ruminants, but there are two or three that are the ones that should frighten you if you're a goat or a sheep. Uh, and you'll know which ones those are in a minute. Why should they frighten you? Because some of them will kill sheep and goats. And I'm sure many of you have had that unfortunate first-hand experience. We need to understand the life cycle of the parasites we're going to talk about in order to control them properly and on a long-term basis. And I'm going to tell you about their life cycles because it's exactly the same for all the important ones. And finally, in this little presentation, I want to ask the question, how do these parasites survive the winter in Canada? Because you'd think staying outside would kill most things. So how do they get from one grazing season to the next? And lastly, because I won't have covered this until the very end, what about tapeworms? Because that's probably the one parasite you've seen in feces. The rest, too small typically to see in feces uh, on pasture. So, what are the most important intestinal parasites of small ruminants? They're called gastrointestinal nematodes. The first word means they live somewhere between the abomasum and the rear end of the intestinal tract. And the second word means they're small roundworms. So the word nematode just means a small roundworm. This is the biggest one. This biggest one is no more than a cent an inch in length. This is the barber pole worm, Hemonchus. But it's by far the biggest. It's only an inch in length. Uh, and I've certain that one's out on the table here, if you want to come and look at it a bit later. It's on the table to the right. But to be honest, if I was a sheep, this is the one I would be most frightened about. It's the one most likely to kill me. What have we learned about the gastrointestinal roundworms, or nematodes, that infect small ruminants in Ontario? We found there are a lot of them. And I'm going to tell you all the names, but most of them are not particularly important. If you start at the front end of the digestive system, there's three parasites that live in the abomasum. The first, the brown stomach worm, or teladosager, used to be known as ostatager. Unfortunately, parasitologists have a habit of renaming things. So if you hear teladosager, it just means ostatager, the brown stomach worm. Also living in the abomasum is Hemonchus, the barber pole worm. And the third one, the stomach hair worm, also lives there. If you then move down to the small intestine, we've shown that Ontario small ruminants 
can be make, infected with at least four different other small roundworms. And if you go down to the large intestine, there's another three. Now, vet students roll their eyes when you show all these names. But the reality is there's only three that are really important. The three really important ones that impact production are the small roundworms that live in the abomasum. So that's Teladosagia, or Ostatagia as we used to know, Hemonchus, and Trichostrongulus. What do they all produce? Well, they all produce eggs, but unfortunately, the eggs of all the three important parasites look exactly the same. And if you were to look at a fecal sample from a sheep or a goat infected with those parasites, that's what the eggs look like. I can't tell who's produced them at this point. We call these eggs gastrointestinal nematode eggs. You'll sometimes see slides with the letters gin eggs. It doesn't mean the sheep's consuming alcohol. It stands for <laughs> gastrointestinal nematode eggs. So they all produce identical eggs, and they all have exactly the same life cycle. Let me explain it, because people throughout today are going to keep coming back to this. All of the three important parasites live in the abomasum of small ruminants. Once they're mature, they produce eggs that pass into the environment. When those eggs end up in the environment, where are they initially? The eggs. They're in feces. Now these parasites are not stupid. They know that most sheep and goats don't walk around eating feces. So they've got to get out of the feces into, and I've brought some with me, this is what's fundamentally important today, grass. These parasites cannot mature unless they're associated with grass. So what happens? Well, these eggs in feces sit in the feces for at least a few days, and a tiny little worm develops inside the eggs. Then what happens? It breaks out of the egg. It's still in feces. And like a snake, it molts twice within the feces. It keeps growing, it keeps molting to what's called the third stage larva. On some of the slides today, you'll see the letters L3. It just means the infective third stage larva. This is what will infect sheep and goats. But to do that, they know we've got to get out of feces. So what do they do? They crawl out of the feces onto grass. If you don't believe me, here's a picture. This is two pictures of drops of dew on grass early in the morning. And if you have nothing better to do this summer, early one morning, get a big magnifying glass, go out into the field, lie in the grass, and look at drops of dew. Is there anything more exciting first thing in the morning? <laughs> but can you see these tiny little worms sitting in the drops of dew? What are they waiting for? They're waiting to be eaten by a sheep or a goat. So they sit there waiting to be eaten, and then what happens? Once they're ingested by the sheep or the goat, they get back to the abomasum, and after about three weeks, they're fully mature, and they're able to produce eggs. So once a sheep ingests the infective stages on grass, it takes about three weeks before they can shed eggs. So the parasites occur both in sheep and in grass, and what's incredibly important for long-term managing parasites is the fact that probably 70 to 80% of all these parasites on your farm, they're not in sheep, they're on grass. And managing the environment, to be honest, as you'll see today, is much more important in the long run than giving dewormers to sheep and goats. We've relied on drugs in the past, You'll see by the end of today, we can't rely on those drugs anymore. We've got to start managing parasites in the environment. So what's the disease these parasites cause? Essentially, two different types of disease. This is the one that would frighten me as a sheep. Why? It's called Hemonchus, the barber pole worm. You can see one here, it's about an inch long. Do you know why it's bright red? Any guess what it's feeding on? Blood. Wait, yeah, blood. Absolutely. Um, on average, one of these parasites will ingest about 50 microliters of blood a day. That means if you have a thousand, and I've seen many sheep with 20, 30,000, but just a thousand will cause an animal to lose 50 microliters of blood a day. For all these parasites, low numbers are not a problem. Large numbers are. Here's the abomasum from a highly infected sheep. 
Can you see all these, bra these reddish lines? There's thousands of homunculus in the Abomasum of this particular sheep. What are they doing in the Abomasum? They're feeding on blood. Every one of these little bleeding points is where one of these parasites has been feeding. They ingest blood and blood leaks into the gut because of this feeding habit. What do you see clinically? Clinically, you'll see pale mucous membranes um, around the eyes of small ruminants and Paula Menzies will talk to you more about the Fermatra system for determining how bad that is. If it's really bad, they become dull and lethargic. They even may develop accumulation of fluid under the jaw, or what's called bottle jaw. So all those clinical signs tell you you've got a hemonchus infection. When do you see disease from hemonchus? In Ontario, it's very seasonal. Uh, I'm sure many of you can relate to this. It's typically worst in lambs because they haven't developed immunity. Um, and when do you see it? Usually the second half of the summer, July and particularly August, in a summer when it's been hot and humid. They don't like dry environments, but when the grass stays green all summer, those parasites can survive for a long period on pasture. We do occasionally see the same disease in ewes at this time of the year, and I'll tell you why that is in a few moments. So that's Hemonchus. The other two nasty parasites that live in the Abomasum produce the same type of disease. Um, probably the most important is this one called Teladosager, what used to be called Ostatager. Can you see this Abomasum here? There's lumps and bumps in the wall. There's no blood loss when these guys are causing disease. Why? Because when they're ingested, the parasites migrate into the wall of the Abomasum. What's the effect? What the effect is, digest whatever it's eating. And the end result is the production of soft feces or diarrhea. All right? It can be more subtle, just like Hemonchus can, with just having the impact on growth rates in growing animals. And occasionally, you'll see bottle jaw. So here's another Abomasum. This is from an animal that had died. Can you see these little lumps in the wall? It's because parasites have migrated into the wall. You don't get any anemia with these parasites, but you get soft feces and diarrhea. So this probably is a familiar sight to many of you. So animals that clearly have got diarrhea or soft feces. Important thing to appreciate, gastrointestinal nematodes will cause this, but other things like coccidia can as well. And so that's why it's very important to get a fecal examined from animals and not assuming it's necessarily the parasites that we're talking about today. Here's the question, though, that's very important to managing parasites long term. How do these parasites survive the Canadian winter? Although I appreciate we haven't had much of a winter uh, over the last year. They survive two ways, which always surprised me when I arrived here from the UK a few years ago. I thought nothing could survive the Canadian winter. It's not true. These parasites certainly can survive the winter at the bottom of the pasture. And, most importantly, they can also survive the winter inside your animals. What we've learned here from Ontario, the two parasites that cause soft feces and diarrhea survive very well on pasture. All of them survive very well inside your animals. <coughs> but note, Haemonchus <coughs> looks as though it entire, almost entirely survives from one grazing season to the next, not on pasture, but in your animals. So, we know they can survive on pasture, but we've also found out they can survive the winter, as I just said, inside animals. Why? Something very strange happens with the life cycle of these parasites towards the end of the grazing season. I told you during the regular grazing season, when an animal gets infected with par parasites on pasture, it takes about three weeks before they can start producing eggs. Something happens towards the end of the grazing season, if we think it's because of the drop in temperatures, once those parasites are ingested towards the end of the grazing season, they go dormant inside your animals. They're not stupid. They know if we produce eggs, freezing conditions will kill them. So in the fall, they, all the ingested parasites go dormant inside the animal, and they lie there, asleep basically, for the whole winter. What then happens? This time of the year, they wake up. How do they know, living inside a sheep, that it's warmer outside? 
We really don't know, but they do. They wake up at this time of the year in the spring, and they start producing eggs. Why is that important? Number one, that results in contamination of the pasture onto which you turn them out on. And number two, if there's large numbers of parasites, you will get disease in animals at this time of the year. Some of you may have seen sick ewes at this time of the year, and this is part of that phenomenon. The parasites have waken up, woken up and start causing disease. Last question, what about tapeworms? Because I haven't mentioned them, and yet they're probably the one parasite you've seen. Is this a familiar picture? These white structures, often if they're freshly passed uh, feces, you can see them here. Um, what are they produced by? They're produced by the tapeworm. I've got a part of one on the right here. These can be many meters in length. You usually just see these small segments passed out uh, in feces. How do sheep get infected? They must be on grass. They must be on grass to get infected. But there's a very odd life cycle that involves grass. If you were to look at the feces of sheep with tapeworms, you see these strange looking eggs. If sheep eat those eggs or goats eat those eggs, nothing happens. For the life cycle to continue, tiny little mites, non-parasitic mites that live in grass, have to ingest those eggs. How do you think sheep and goats get infected with tapeworms? They have to eat these little guys. All right? So they eat these, eat these guys, and then the tapeworms develop in their gut. How important are tapeworms? There's a lot of data that indicates they have no impact. However, there's clearly some farms where they do have an impact on production and growth rates. I've seen animals die with blocked intestines. And so this is the discussion you need to have with your veterinarian. Do you need preventative treatment or not? I think the bottom line is, not every farm requires preventative treatment for tapeworms. Some do. And that's a discussion that you need to have with your vet. That's everything I was going to cover in this first talk. Any questions? Yes, over here. Where in the animals do these uh, lie dormant? So where, that's, what a great question. Where inside animals do these parasites lie dormant? All the ones I've mentioned, when they get into the abomasum, the last chamber of the stomach. They literally either go dormant on the surface or they burrow into the wall and just go to sleep there for many months. But why they wake up in the spring is a mystery. Yes, someone at the front. Yeah, the scarring that's in the other mason caused by the, the parasites, is it permanent? So it, would it, let's say if you have a, a bad problem in your lambs, is it going to affect the digestive ability of that animal as a mature animal? So I repeat, so the question is, is the damage that's done in the abomasum, is it reversible or permanent? Yes. The, most of it's reversible, the, particularly the quicker you get on top of the problems. But if you let animals have long-term infections, it often, they never completely recover. But within a few weeks, a month or so, usually there's complete recovery. Any other questions? Yeah, the person in green. Um, uh you said that most of them, it takes the three weeks until they start producing eggs. Does anyone have any idea how, how long a given individual produces eggs after that? Eggs. So how long do these guys produce eggs? Well, just like you and me, they have a finite lifespan. Um, they don't usually live for more than long, longer than a few months. All right? It depends on the time of the year because the immune system will clear them. But they usually will produce eggs during the summer months for a good few months. All right, but most of them probably have died out within six to eight months. Yeah, someone had a question. Yeah, at the back. Uh, when you see anemia in a sheep or the fluid in the jaw, can one conclude that it's never tape that's causing that? Can, so if you see bottle jaw, can you conclude it's not tapes? I've never seen any data that associates bottle jaw with tapeworm infections. Paula, did you want to comment on that? Um, no. But there are so, but there is more than one parasite that will cause bottle jaw. I mean, the most important thing is get fecal samples examined uh, at that point to try and find out what's causing the problem. But I've never seen an association with tape rooms. Yes? A hypothetical question. If I have my sheep in the barn and these uh, mongoose have a, a life cycle, they you don't know, last forever, <coughs> they're going to quit laying eggs. Should I even bother with? 
So, is, is the question, can animals get infected inside? Is that the question? Well, sort of, yeah. I mean, is there a way of, I'm looking at a way of not bothering with any kind of uh, anthropomentic if, if, if these guys are going to die sooner or later. So, the, the important issue is if you keep your animals indoors permanently, so for instance, dairy animals, that can sometimes be the case, all right, then you essentially don't need to bother. There is evidence they may get infected with very low levels, but of, you typically have no clinical significance. So if you keep animals indoors permanently, the risk of these parasites is essentially zero. They must be ingesting pasture. Now there's sometimes some infection because of the hay that's being fed that can be slightly infected, but it's incredibly rare. If you keep animals indoors, you'll see significant parasite numbers. Right? They, I mean, they have to essentially be ingesting fresh grass. Yes? One more question. Yeah. How effective are dewormers on dormant Haemonchus? So how effective are dewormers on dormant Haemonchus when they go on dormant? It depends on the drug. Uh, and Jocelyn Jansen, I know, is going to come back to that issue. Jocelyn? She's way in the distance. <coughs> she doesn't even need a microphone. <laughs> She's going to come back to this issue because it's a very relevant question. Because some drugs don't have much of an impact, some are highly effective when there's no resistance. Anita, did you have some clicker questions? We have some clicker questions. Do you want a clicker? Can everyone remember how to use the clickers? Canadian. 